very much. Thank you. So reading, firstly, from Exodus 34, from verse 29, this is Moses' second take two of the tablets of stone. Remember this a while ago um, in Exodus, we'll read where God gave Moses the first ones and... Um, because the people of Israel were being difficult, Moses had a hissy fit and smashed them. And uh, then, um, so this is a second lot. And uh, so Moses has gone up the mountain. And uh, this is what happened from verse uh, 29 in chapter th- Exodus chapter 34. Moses came down from the mountain, Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hands, either the second ones, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near and he gave them in commandment all the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites what he had been commanded. The Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put a veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Just one of the many expressions of the outward manifestation of the glory of God in the Old Testament. Now we'll hear one of the many in the New Testament And this is from Luke chapter 9, from verse 28. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and James, John and James, and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to them. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that... For us to be here, let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice saying, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent. And in those days, no one told no one any of the things they had seen. What is the glory of God? Now, I have to say, what I'm about to share today in no way encapsulates encapsulates anything near all we could learn about this topic. From the scriptures. That would take a series of sermons as long as my Revelation series if we really wanted to cover it more. So, this is one aspect of it, but I am going to ask the question what do we mean by glory? In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is kabod, in the New Testament, the Greek word is doxa. They essentially mean exactly the same. It's, it's in a sense, radiance, honor, praise. Keep this in mind as we reflect on this today. Radiance, praise, honour. As we read in the Old Testament, when God gave Moses the tablets of stone up on the mountain, we read that this is the first lot. We didn't hear this today. The first lot, we read that the appearance of God was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain. That's in Exodus 24. What we read today from Exodus 34, we read when the new tablets were made and Moses was up again on the mountain, 
he came down, his face was shining. The glory of God was reflected in his face. We read in the New Testament that Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James and John. Again, his face changed. His clothes became dazzling white. These were like outward manifestations of the glory of God. But what do we mean to glorify God, to give God glory? When we see his glory, what do we see? And what I want to say is we need to be careful that we're not preoccupied with outward signs, outward manifestations of God's glory, that we miss the core of what the truly the glory of God is. So just again a bit of background, Moses had just spent 40 days and nights up Mount Sinai in the presence of the Lord, who was giving him the words to write on the tablets, the second ones. We read in Exodus 34, 5, that the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there. And proclaimed the Lord. This is earlier in our reading. This is back at verse 6 of verse 34. And we read this. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed these words in verse 6 of 34. It's on the screen. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's what the Lord said. As the cloud descended and as we said when Moses came down, his face was shining. He didn't know that his face was shining when he came down the mountain. And we read that Moses would put a veil over his face to cover that unless he was speaking with the Lord. In other words, Moses saw the glory of the Lord And the glory of the Lord was reflected in his face. I'm going to say that again. Moses saw the glory of the Lord and the glory of the Lord was reflected in his face. That visible expression of the glory of God. There are other outward manifestations of the glory of God in the Old Testament. Many such as the dedication of Solomon's temple. In the New Testament, there were many manifestations of the glory of God through the miracles of Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000, the changing the water to wine, walking on water, the many healings and setting people free from demonic oppression. They were outward signs, wow, of the glory of God. And the one we read today in the Old Testament that visible outward manifestation of his glory came in the shining face of Moses. Then we read in Luke 9, when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, he took with him Peter, James and John up the mountain to pray. And while he was there, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became dazzling white. Moses and Elijah appeared talking with him. Imagine just just experiencing that as Peter, James and John did. They wanted to make a shelter for them all. It was an interesting uh, saying, wasn't it? You know, hey, Jesus, let's just build a shelter for the three of you. What's that about? But the cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice said, this is my chosen, chosen, my son. Listen to him. Another outward manifestation of the glory of God and they wanted to capture it that's what I reckon the shelters were about they wanted to capture the glory they wanted to hold it there they wanted to capture the outward expression of the glory man they had just seen Moses and Elijah all the people they read about and studied about, the prophet of old and Moses, their, the whole, their whole the basis of the Old Testament covenant, of the freedom and the promised land. You know, these were the stars. They just wanted to capture that. What about today? How do we experience the signs of God's glory today? 
I, I today felt a beautiful sense of his presence in, in worship as we were singing those songs of praise. As so, Joanna, so, uh, Joanna so beautifully and sensitively led us in worship. I, I was just, uh, I sensed his presence. That's an outward expression of the glory of God. Answers to prayer. When we got sovereign, get sovereign, answers to prayer. When we experience healings, that's an answer to prayer. I remember reading a few years ago of a, through Reinhard Bonnke's ministry in Africa, uh, a man holding a copy of his own death certificate. I know, that, you would say, is an answer, an expression of the glory of God. Well, you know, we don't see much of it in this country, but Jesus raised the dead and he said, these signs will follow those who believe. We hear of those happening, interesting, more in third world countries than here. But there are examples. People falling under his power. People having visitations from angels. They're all outward manifestations of the glory of God. Just like in the New Testament. And Peter and James and John on the mountain wanted to contain the outward expression of God's glory. And as Christians today... We must be careful we don't hunger after and chase for the outward expressions of glory alone, but rather we seek the true essence of the glory of God. What is the reason God is a God of glory? Why is he honoured? What is it about him that we wish to honour and praise? So let's go back to the Old Testament and look again what this outward expression of God's glory represented. Back to Exodus 34, let's look at this again. What did the law say to Moses when he revealed himself on Mount Sinai? The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. My dear brothers and sisters, this is the glory of God. Not the cloud, not the shining face. They are signs of his glory. And he still gives those signs today. But we don't give him glory because of the signs we give him honour and praise for who he is. And who he is is a God who bound, abounds in not only love, but steadfast love. A God who bounds in faithfulness. A God who is merciful. A God who is gracious beyond anything that we can imagine. God's glory, God's honour, God's radiance is ultimately seen, friends, in his steadfast love and faithfulness. And in the New Testament, as recorded in John's Gospel, Jesus revealed how God would truly be glorified. And it wasn't through making a shelter for him. He wouldn't be glorified by building a shelter to contain him. No, this is how Jesus said, referred to it. In John 12, 23, Jesus said, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So what was Jesus referring to when he said the Son of Man was to be glorified? Was he saying he was going to be transfigured even more powerfully before him? Was it going to be he was going to call and reign in all the cohorts of heaven to overturn the Roman government and come as the mighty conqueror? Was that how the Son of Man was about to be glorified? No. You know what Jesus was referring to there, don't you, when he said the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified? He was referring to, he was about, he was about to go to the cross. Jesus was about to turn the whole meaning of glory end on end. The understanding of glory in the kingdom of this world 
is things like victory parades and the accolades we give to famous people or athletes who win gold in the Olympics and ticker take parades and a whole lot of attention where we rouse and acclamation and raise up. Jesus had just turned glory end on end. Listen to what he said in John 12. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come in this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ... This is the glory of God. God's amazing, steadfast, sacrificial love expressed in his own son on the cross of Calvary. This is God still abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness as he said to Moses on the mountain, So he was now saying through his only son as he hung there in agony, taking on himself the full force of everything that keeps us separate from God. This is the expression of his steadfast love and faithfulness. This is God's glory. This is God's honour. This is God's radiance seen in his steadfast love. God's Amazing, sacrificial love. In the words of the hymn writer Isaac Watts, it's a love so amazing, so divine, that it demands my soul, my life, my all. As it was in the time of Moses, friends, So it is in Jesus. The glory of God is most fully expressed in his love. The glory of God is ultimately the love of God. So how do we respond to this? How do we respond to the glory of God? Through praise, through worship, through prayer? Absolutely. Absolutely. But if that's all we do, we're missing something critical here. Let's move. Oh, sorry, that's probably too difficult to read. I'll read it out for you. Sorry about that. That font's way too small. This is in from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 18. Listen to what Paul says as he reflects on the veil that was over Moses' face. He says, Since then... We have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside, but their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Testament, the same veil is still there. Since only in Christ is that veil removed. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, the veil veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And listen to this. And all of us, says Paul, with unveiled faces seeing the glory of God as though reflected in a mirror are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another this comes from the Lord the spirit let's unpack this Moses used to put a veil over his face so the people could not see him directly we read that in Exodus See the glory of God directly. Paul says, Jesus, the veil is torn away. Jesus tore the holy veil away when he died on the cross. Remember, the the curtain in the temple was torn in two. The temple, the curtain that hid 
the holy of holies, where the very presence of God, he tore that away. The veil over Moses' face was torn away. In dying on the cross, Jesus tore that veil away. Paul says, now where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We see in Jesus the glory of God as reflected in a mirror. But let's look at this critical, critical, critic, oh, slow down, Mark. Let's look at this critical line again from chapter 3, verse 18. I'm just excited about it, you see. And when I get excited, I talk too quickly. My mind goes quicker than my mouth. Look at this. And actually, there are times when the reverse is true. My mouth goes quicker than my mind. That's when I get myself into trouble. <laughs> Focus. Anyway, let's regroup. <laughs> Look at this again. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord, as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the way we glorify God. By yielding to the Spirit, by humbling ourselves before the Lord and allowing the Spirit of God to transform us into that same image from one degree of glory to another. A journey... From until we reach the other side of eternity, where we're with him forever, where we're called, commissioned and enabled by the Spirit of God within us as we allow him to transform us so that more of that glory of God is seen in us. What does that mean? What is the glory of God to be seen in us? The steadfast love of God. The sacrificial love of God. The glory of God, the heart of the glory of God, seen in and through us, is not just if we lay hands on people and they get healed, praise God, bring it on, let it happen more often. That's an outward sign of God's glory. Is the glory of God seen with us if we prophesy with such accuracy? The word cuts to the hearts of people. Yes, bring it on. Is the glory of God seen when we flow in all of the gifts of the Spirit? Absolutely. That's what he gave them for. But remember, they are outward expressions of the glory of God. The glory of God will be seen more and more and more in us as we allow the Lord to transform us so that more and more and more of his steadfast love, his sacrificial love is seen in and through us because that is the essence of the glory of God. The more we allow the Spirit of God to transform us, so that the more of our lives reflect this sacrificial love. In other words, the more we obey the second greatest commandment as well as the first, the greatest, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind or strength. And what did Jesus say? The second is love your neighbour as yourself. They weren't meant to be. One was secondary to the other. Those two are inextricably bound together. We cannot love our neighbour, God, without loving others and vice versa. John makes that abundantly clear in his letters. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is is love this is glorifying god the more and more our lives reflect that sacrificial 
unconditional love. We'll never get it right this side. We'll never fully, fully, fully get that while we're still living in this world, the kingdom of this world. But what did Paul say? He didn't say we'll get it right. He said being transformed into his likeness one degree after another. And there will be times in my life where I feel it's just one degree. There are times where I really feel I'm flowing with him and maybe I do a few more degrees and more of him. There are other times I feel like I've gone backwards and lost some of those degrees and I have to start again. And God is so, remember, he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He is so incredibly patient with me, as he is with you, as he everyone. Because why is he so patient? Why is he far more patient than I am? Why does he not give up on us when we could give up on people? Because, because of his steadfast love for you and for me and the world. For Moses, as he came down from Mount Sinai, the glory of God was reflected in his face. For Jesus, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the glory of God was reflected in his face. How wonderful would it be if the glory of God was reflected in our faces? Friends, it can be. It can be. Take some time to reflect on what I have on the screen now. I believe with every fibre of my being that people will see the glory of God reflected in our faces when they see the love of God reflected in and through our lives. I'm going to say that again. People will see the glory of God reflected in our faces when they see the love of God reflected in and through our lives, when they see more and more and more of Jesus. The sacrificial love demonstrated in our lives. And so... Returning to that question, I asked at the beginning, what is the glory of God? It's love. Love is the glory of God. Steadfast love. Sacrificial love. Indiscriminate love. Unconditional love. Eternal love. Love is the essence of the glory of God. And through the Holy Spirit, we encounter this love in Jesus. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to gain more and more reign in our lives, as we do everything we can, we won't do it perfectly because we're human, but as we do everything we can to say, Lord, I, I want to be obedient to your command to deny myself and take up my cross and follow you. That means, Lord, I want to bring these attitudes that don't glorify you before you. Jesus, I'm struggling to really, you know, God, there's some people I'm having a hard trouble liking, let alone loving. I need your help in this. Oh, come on, I'm not the only one, surely. <laughs> I need your help. But see, what he wants is a, a humble heart. Not just pretending... We've got it all together and how anointed we are and how spiritual we are when underneath we're repressing all this stuff. No, he wants us to be real and all he wants is a contrite heart, a humble heart. In scripture and song we used to sing, haven't sung it for a while here, that chorus, Jesus take me as I am, I can come no other way, take me deeper into you. Make my flesh life melt away. Make me like a precious stone, crystal clear and finely honed. Life of Jesus shining through, giving glory back to you. Jesus, take that. I didn't have that. That just came to me now. Jesus, take. Who knows that one? 
Can someone give us a note? Jesus, take me as I can come no other way. Take me deeper into you. Make my flesh life melt away. Make me like a precious stone. Crystal clear and finely honed. Life of Jesus shining through, giving glory back to you. Friends, that's all he wants, a humble heart. Just take me as I am, Lord, and come no other way. When we try to come another way, we're not being authentic. Just come as we are. Because you know what? With that heart, my dear brothers and sisters... With that heart, that gives the Holy Spirit permission to do his stuff within us. When we try to do it our way, when we try to put a step up a lip, when we try to strive in our own strength, that earths the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. Because, see, God doesn't impose himself. He gives us a choice. God, the Holy Spirit, is not going to compete with our flesh if we want to hang on to it. That's our choice. But when we come with that prayer, that gives permission for the Holy Spirit to do more than we could imagine, that we might see more and more of the glory of God. You know what? I actually think that song we just sang is uh, a really great one to finish with. Well, let's see if we can find the words of it and put up. We just, can you, uh, we just, if we, I'll just bear with me at the minute. I might, um, I put poor Laurie on the spot here. <laughs> Jesus, take me as I am. I can come no other way. Take me deeper into you. Make my flesh life melt away. Make me like a precious stone. Crystal clear and finely honed, life of Jesus shining through, giving glory back to you. Jesus, take me as I am. I can come no other way. Take me deeper into you, make my flesh life melt away, make me like a precious stone, crystal clear and finely honed. Life of Jesus shining through, giving glory back to you.
Amen. And so, Lord, we ask that you will keep this prayer on our hearts and our minds, not just our lips, but our hearts and our minds this week, that you will shine through and you will be glorified in and through us. Amen.